Hi everyone. Um, so I originally did the Facebook Live and thought I was going to be able to take the recording and put it onto my YouTube channel, but I was not able to. So um, I'm a couple days later from when I actually presented this um, presentation on Heart Matters Part 2, uh, where we are now looking at one of the risk factors called dyslipidemia or um, high cholesterol. So I'm re-recording it um, so that you can now see this at a later date. And then that being said, my plan is to also record the part one that we did originally in the very beginning over Zoom. Again, I'm not very tech savvy and so I hadn't recorded it. So I will um, create a video for you so that you can review that as well. And that was how um, Heart Matters part one and we're do we are doing hypertension. Okay, so I am naturopathic Dr. Jacqueline Moulton or Dr. J. Moulton, ND. Um, whether you're here for the first time, you were here for part one, um, where we walked through hypertension, um, I just wanna thank you for um, watching this video and I'd like to welcome you um, please share any of your comments and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, a little bit about me, in my undergraduate degree at uh, Brock University here in Niagara, I experienced a family loss um, from heart disease. My soon-to-be uncle actually passed away in his 30s um, due to a heart issue. And so then this propelled me to learn more about cardiology um, in my undergraduate degree, I uh, did cardiology, cardiac rehabilitation, cardiac farm, <laughs> just anything I could just to understand and learn more about it. Um, and then from that, it kind of put me through this pathway of preventative medicine. And in doing so, I discovered naturopathic medicine, um, which then led me into my journey of becoming a naturopathic doctor. So heart disease is one of the leading causes of death in Canada. And for most cases, it can be prevented. So what do I mean by that? So I'm hoping that in this video, you get some preventative medicine tidbits. Um, so lifestyle and nutrition hacks that you can implement today to help you improve your overall heart health. And by doing that, we're reducing risk factors. So in this video, we're going to specifically look at the risk factor of dyslipidemia. Dyslipidemia is a fancy medical term for high cholesterol. So have you heard of the words, um, there's good versus bad cholesterol? This is an oversimplification. Um, the biochemical makeup and science behind heart disease is way, way more complicated, but for the majority and just for the ease of understanding it, we call LDL the bad cholesterol and HDL the good cholesterol. And the reason for that is HDL brings the cholesterol back to the liver, reducing it in the bloodstream. So there's less cholesterol running around the body. And then LDL moves it out of the liver and throughout the body. So it increases in the bloodstream so that our cells can get it. Why do our cells need it? Well, cholesterol is super important in developing hormones. So you know those hormones that you're required to have, uh, women's especially for your menstrual cycle and everything else. Um, yeah, no, cholesterol is the backbone. Um, and so these carrier molecules allow the cells to use the cholesterol that's needed for the body to function. The problem arises when these carrier molecules that are in the bloodstream become oxidized. So that's where the whole good and bad kind of makes sense because if you have a lot of it in the bloodstream, you're more likely to have it oxidized. If you have a lot less in the bloodstream, then it can't, can't be oxidized. It's not, in, it's not where it needs to be. Okay. So things called reactive oxygen species oxidize these carrier molecules, the LDL, HDL. 
and then this causes those molecules to become plaques and then later on it's called atherosclerosis um, which is a buildup of plaque in the bloodstream or in the blood vessels that ends up blocking blood flow so this can lead to obstructive heart disease you may have heard the term um, a blood clot or an embolism that's when the, the clot itself has a uh, kind of removed itself from the wall and now it's traveling through the bloodstream. That can happen in the lungs, it can happen in the heart, it can happen in the brain. And so um, the goal is to prevent these plaques from ever building up. Um, one of the main causes of heart attack is when the coronary arteries, so the arteries that supply the bloodstream right to the heart, um, become blocked. And so when you start having like a plaque buildup blocking the vessel to around 70%, you're gonna start getting things like angina, uh, which is like chest pain. Um, and then as it gets further and further, you may have an infarction and that's when the blood flow has stopped going through that vessel. And so then oxygen's not getting to where it needs to be and then there's cell death. So this is why high cholesterol is seen as a risk factor for heart disease because um, if you have high cholesterol, you have a likelihood of getting those plaque developments, which then causes the blood flow issues. So you see how it's not that simplifi simplified. It's, it's a step-by-step -step process. It doesn't happen all at once. However, we do know it is a bit more complicated than straight black and white, kind of like I said. That's because if high cholesterol always caused heart disease, then simply lowering your cholesterol with medications would solve the problem, right? No. The Evidence-Based Medicine podcast explains that cholesterol is only a biomarker of risk. What does that mean? So it just, it's a lab value. It tells us what we have, but um, changing that lab value up and down doesn't necessarily mean it's going to cause a cardiovascular outcome. And so the risk, the biomarker risk is there, um, but they've actually shown that medications that only lower cholesterol such as fibrates, bile acid sequestrants, or cholesterol absorption inhibitors, don't seem to have any effect on those cardiovascular outcomes or mortality risk related to heart disease, even though they do bring down the cholesterol. The only medication shown to effectively both lower cholesterol and lower your risk of death related to heart disease is something called an M or sorry, HMG, CoA reductase inhibitor, also commonly known as a statin. So this would be like your, the most common ones I see is Rovastat. Um, whenever treating heart disease risk factors, you must think, why am I taking this medication or supplement? Will this help reduce my risk of death? Right? Like that's the, that's the reason why we're taking things. We don't want to die of heart disease. Will it reduce my risk of a heart attack or a stroke? Will it improve my quality of life? So that's something that not everybody actually um, checks and it is harder to research because quality of life is a bit more subjective. Um, but for example, if you have a stroke and you can't use half of your body or you're not able to eat properly, like that would be reduced quality of life. Um, or if you're hospitalized and you have to stay in a hospital setting or you need nursing care now because of the cardiovascular outcomes that happen, I would say that that's a reduced quality of life. So, because if it can't help you prevent these things, then why does it even matter if it lowers cholesterol? Did you know that eating healthy fat actually reduces your cholesterol? Yes, eating fat reduces your fat. <laughs> the research shows that a Mediterranean diet or a diet high in omega-3 fatty acids is as effective as a low-dose statin. 
So if you're newly diagnosed with high cholesterol or you have a family history of heart disease, I would recommend starting with your diet. However, if you have a familial hypercholesteremia, this is a genetic disorder and cannot be treated with naturopathic medicine alone. It requires medication and constant monitoring from a medical doctor or a cardiologist. My top supplemental recommendations for high cholesterol is fish oils, uh, which are high in omega-3 fatty acids, an anti-inflammatory fat that has been shown to reduce heart disease. It's perfect for those who don't like eating fish, but still eat meat. Over three grams of fish oil a day actually thins the blood, kind of like how you would thin your blood with a baby aspirin, uh, which is also a health benefit for obstructive heart disease. So those atherosclerosis plaque buildups. However, if you are on blood thinners, or have a bleeding disorder, so your blood runs pretty thin already, it is not recommended to dose above 2.5 grams per day. So what if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, so you don't eat meat, don't eat fish? Well, congrats, because a high vegetable and fruit-based diet will reduce your overall risk of heart disease by increasing antioxidants and reducing those nasty reactive oxygen species. Reminder, the reactive oxygen species is what oxidizes the cholesterol in the first place in your blood, and then that creates the plaque. So if you have more antioxidants or less oxygen species around, then you're inherently gonna have less plaque buildup, whether or not your cholesterol is high. Make sense? Okay. Uh, did you know that there are vegan-friendly omega-3 sources? So you can still get the benefit of omega-3 fatty acids even if you're vegan. Some options that are available are walnuts and flaxseed. Uh, flaxseed has other benefits such as um, it's a phytoestrogen so, and it's used a lot in hormone balancing. So if you want to learn more about flaxseed, I'm sure I'll post something about it further on. There are many nutraceuticals known to reduce LDL levels. However, only a few have been shown to increase HDL. So remember, HDL levels were considered good cholesterol because it removes the cholesterol from the bloodstream. So it's known to be protective against cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, niacin is one of those things. So niacin is a vitamin B3 typically dosed around 1,200 to 3,000 milligrams, depending on your age, um, is shown to increase HDL levels by 15 to 35%, while also decreasing your triglyceride levels by roughly 20%. The term niacin is often used to refer to nicotinic acid. It is not related to nicotine found in tobacco, although their names are similar. So, Remember I said um, I don't take anything unless there's a specific reason why, and in heart disease, our outcome is reducing cardiovascular events, right, or death related to heart disease. So it's great that it helps with dyslipidemia. We know it increases HDL and decreases triglycerides, but how does it affect heart disease outcomes? Well, let's look at the research. Several trials have investigated whether uh, niacin therapy alone or in combination with medications such as statins can affect heart disease outcomes. One of these studies is called the Coronary Drug Project. Followed, they followed 8,000 men, so it's a pretty big patient population, um, who experienced a previous heart attack and they followed them over six years. Patients who took three grams of immediate release nicotinic acid or niacin daily experienced 27% reduction in recurrent non-fatal heart attacks and a 26% reduction in cerebrovascular events such as a stroke compared to placebo. So I ask you, do you want to reduce your risk by 26 or 27% chance of getting a heart attack or a stroke? I would. Um, and so in addition, 
They followed them for an additional nine year follow up post trial and it revealed 10% reduction in total deaths with nicotinic acid treatments. Another study called the HATS study or HDL atherosclerosis treatment study um, was a three year trial, only 160 patients, so a smaller group that had documented coronary heart disease. So that's the narrowing of the um, vessels that supply the blood to the heart and low HDL concentrations found that a combination of simvastatin and nicotinic acid increased HDL concentrations, inhibited the progression of coronary artery narrowing, and decreased the frequency of heart attacks and stroke compared to placebo. So this was a more targeted group um, where we focus on specific measurements like the HDL and the coronary heart disease and whether or not we can reduce the stroke and heart attack complications of this um, disease. Okay, so it reduces your risk of heart disease outcomes, but is it safe? So it's always important, even with natural products, to know whether or not it's safe for you to take. So it has been shown to increase the risk of new onset type two diabetes. And so with diabetes, um, the risk factor of diabetes is, well, yeah, hypo and hyperglycemia, where you could go into a coma or shock, but also the risk of cardiovascular outcomes from having diabetes. So the HAT study showed that glycemic control in diabetic patients, so patients who were already diagnosed with diabetes, returned to pretreatment values after following eight months of the disease management. So what does that mean? It means that patients who were diabetic when they started the HAT study um, had to be monitored very closely for the first eight months. So it took eight months for their body to adjust to the niacin treatment, um, and then they were kind of back to their pretreatment values or control. The um, coronary project study that we talked about before also um, discovered that the cardiovascular benefit of long-term nicotinic acid therapy outweighed the modest increase in risk of newly onset type 2 diabetes. So not everybody gets type 2 diabetes from taking niacin. Um, and then the benefit outweighed the risk. What does that mean? So the main risk of diabetes is cardiovascular outcomes. But if niacin is benefiting you and reducing your risk of cardiovascular disease, then is there really a risk of developing that new onset diabetes that may go away or go back to normal after eight months? So to me, that means that it is safe, but you need to be monitored, right? Um, but before you run out and buy this product, I do caution you. It has a very nasty side effect. Most people cannot tolerate this side effect. So it's called the niacin flush. Although harmless, its symptoms of red, warm, itchy skin can be quite uncomfortable. I myself, I've taken niacin before and I had to run into a cold shower because I just could not handle how itchy and warm my whole body felt. So I do recommend this product but only if you can um, if you can handle that discomfort. And it doesn't last long, but it it, it is a, a discomfortable feeling. Another naturopathic medicine therapy commonly used was red yeast rice. Um, it's a botanical that naturally can, contains um, a statin called lovastatin. However, the FDA has banned this ingredient in at least Canada. I don't know about elsewhere in the world. Um, so the red yeast rice products on the market currently have had the lovastatin removed. Um, I know this was recent. We had some products in the clinic when I was 
in school that had the lovastatin and then by the time i left school they had changed all those products to no longer having it but still having the red yeast rice so i mean i'm not a conspiracy theorist at all but what <laughs> it to me it makes no sense that we can um sell a drug and prescribe a drug but we cannot take that exact same drug that naturally occurs in a product and sell it on a shelf. Um, I just don't understand this, but that's okay. So um, personally, I do not recommend red yeast rice because the research conducted on this product was always with the natural product, which contains the lovastatin. Um, because there's not a whole lot of research out there with the lovastatin removed. I really don't know if it has any effect. And there are many other products out there that uh, reduce LDL and reduce your risk of heart disease. So I wouldn't necessarily gravitate to needing the red yeast rice anyways. So some examples are artichoke, green tea, ginger, psyllium, hibiscus, garlic, and fenugreek. I talk about hibiscus and garlic in the hypertension lecture quite a bit because it's got a lot of benefit on reducing those, uh, your systolic blood pressure, your blood pressure values on top of your LDL. Did you find this video helpful? Do you know anyone who could benefit from this health talk? If yes, please share this video and subscribe um, so that I can provide you with more health education. Thank you.